Good afternoon in Miami Beach. This is Dr. John Bennett for Neurosurgical TV from Miami Beach. Uh, we have the uh, honor of having uh, Dr. Y.R. Yadav, uh, a prominent neurosurgeon educator from, uh, from India. Uh, and I'll let uh, Nar uh, Narayan Swami let to do the proper introduction and run the show. Welcome, Dr. Swami. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. So we have, uh, uh, this is the fifth meeting of the endoscopy in the session conducted by none other than Professor Yadav. Professor Yadav needs no introduction. And uh, today we are lucky to have Professor Hemant Bharatiya from Jaipur, who is well-known neurosurgeon as well as a good uh, endoscopic neurosurgeon. He has put training abroad in US as well as a, a lot of 40 years experience in neuroscopy. And Dr. Ramesh Tilaka, again, a very good endoscopic neurosurgeon has been performing very well throughout India and has been coming on webinar. And Professor Yadav has trained a more than 850 neurosurgeons in the neuroendoscopy. He is the one who, dissect, who described to the world water jet dissection in the endoscopic technique. His articles on endoscopic third ventriculostomy and others have been quoted more than 10,000 10, times. The citation he has got, it's a honor. And he's well known throughout India, as well as the whole world for conducting webinars and workshop with the short introductions. And since we are late, I invite Professor Yadav to give the talk, sir. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think uh, our other panelists also will join in the meantime. Uh, uh, so I start my presentation. Can you, uh, you got my slides and yeah, uh, perfect, this is perfect. okay? Perfect. Sir, thank you. So again, I am grateful to John, sir, for allowing me to um, discuss endoscopic surgery. And uh, today we'll be discussing uh, endoscopic uh, third vent colostomy. I am grateful to my panelists uh, who are very, very well uh, established and a very knowledgeable endoscopic surgeon. So we'll have a good discussion. Professor Hemant Bharti, sir, is my senior and excellent endoscopic surgeon. Uh, Dr. Asim Kataria, uh, Professor Bharti is from Jaipur, uh, India pink city of India, and then uh, Dr. Uh, Rasim Kataria also from there, and uh, Dr. Uh, Ramesh Tigla uh, has uh, extensive experience in endoscopic surgery, and he has a device model on ETV. Uh, we should hear from him as expert comment, and Dr. Subad, Subod Raju from Hyderabad, is also uh, excellent uh, endoscopic surgeon. I think because of some problem, uh, he may not be available, but I, hopefully he'll join soon. So today we'll talk about endoscopic third vent colostomy, which is a very common topic. And I'll try to cover A to Z uh, about the endoscopic third vent colostomy. Although I have a separate, uh, I mean, uh, lecture on uh, complications, uh, avoidance, and uh, and their management on endoscopic third vent colostomy. It's again a very very long uh, topic because I want to discuss everything which is important uh, in the endoscopic third vent colostomy for the big nut. Um, we all know that endoscopic third vent colostomy is used for the treatment of hydrocephalus. Uh, initially, we were using uh, shunt, but now with, uh, with the endoscopic third ventriculostomy, um, we do more and more uh, ETV uh, for patients of hydrocephalus. Um, this allows the CSF to flow directly from basal cistern, bypassing the obstruction, which is in most cases either uh, it is there in the um, aqueduct or uh, in the posterior third ventricle or in the posterior fossa. These are the best indication. So the, the, it is a treatment of choice for obstructive hydrocephalus. 
and it is also useful in selected communicating hydrocephalus. So please, um, I mean, uh, make a note that only selected communicating hydrocephalus in which there is a bulging anterior uh, wall of the third ventricle and the inferior wall of the third ventricle also should be bulging down. So if you have this subgroup, then ETV in this communicating hydrocephalus is also very effective, but this is not uh, very good in acute phases of uh, post hemorrhagic and post infective hydrocephalus, where I think um, one should go for VP shunt. And these are technically demanding. Although I can do uh, ETV in any of these cases, uh, most difficult cases of post hemorrhagic and post infective hydrocephalus, but uh, it doesn't work because of uh, various things which I'll discuss. So even if you struggle and do a ETV, the results are poor. So therefore, should not be performed in acute phase of post hemorrhagic and post infective hydrocephalus. But the results are good when there is a chronic phase of post hemorrhagic and post infective hydrocephalus. Uh, the indications, uh, just to narrate them, the congenital aqueductal stenosis is the best indication. You can do it in Dandy Walker. Malformation, vein of gallon aneurysm with hydrocephalus, syringomyelia with or without cherry malformation with hydrocephalus, uh, but not in case where there's an overcrowding of the positive uh, cranial fossa. Encephalocele with hydrocephalus, myelomeningocele with hydrocephalus. So the congenital anomalies of the brain, if you have hydrocephalus, then usually there is abnormal anatomy. And these, in such patient, it is difficult to do ETV. So I don't advise beginner to do ETV in patients where there is a spinal dysrephis, myelomeningocele associated with hydrocephalus or encephalocele or other congenital malformation because there is an associated other anomalies which make ETV difficult for beginner. Uh, in cranial stenosis, uh, stenostosis with hydrocephalus and TBM, obviously the chronic phase and not in acute phase. Uh, in TBM, uh, we in India face a lot of problem in diagnosing whether it is a TBM or um, it is a, a, a incompletely treated pyogenic meningitis, uh, which can present also as chronic uh, meningitis and hydrocephalus. So in some case, when you do ETV, you can also diagnose because you can see these uh, tuberculomas in the ventricles and also in the third ventricle. So apart from uh, treatment, you can, um, because diagnosis of TBM hydrocephalus sometimes becomes very difficult, especially if antibiotic is given in pyogenic meningitis. So you are in a fix whether it is TBM or partially treated pyogenic meningitis. Neurocystic sarcosis with hydrocephalus, posterior third ventricle tumor with hydrocephalus, any of the posterior fossa tumor or CPU angle tumor with associated hydrocephalus. But here also you should be very careful for beginner because either the brain stem is pushed anteriorly and it is difficult to do ETV or it is a distorted midline may be pushed to the right or the left side. So uh, only after gaining some experience, you should go for ETV. Uh, the secondary ETV, either after the failed ETV or uh, shunt malfunction also has some problem. Um, uh, you have to uh, deal with this in a post-operative period which I'll discuss later on. Uh, the other indication is that um, you can do ETV and a biopsy when there's a lesion in the post third ventricle, uh, in cerebellar infarct with hydrocephalus. Uh, only in selected cases, you should go for ETV only and not decompression. But if there is a brain stem severe compression, then it is better to go for 
post FOS decompression with or without ETV. Uh, the intraventricular hematoma with obstructive hydrocephalus, NPH with bulging anterior wall and the floor, and uh, in some cases of multiloculated hydrocephalus, either it is because of infection or IVH, and in sl slit ventricle syndrome. Uh, but uh, if you have to do two things, you have to do a ETV, the trajectory will be different. And when you do a biopsy of third ventricle tumor, um, then the trajectory is different. So um, uh, there are options available. If you want to go for singer bar hole, especially when uh, the Furman Monroe is large, then you can choose a trajectory in between. There is a trajectory for ETV, the B, and there is a trajectory for biopsy. So in between, you can choose a single bar hole, uh, provided the Furman Monroe is large, and you, you can move your endoscope anteriorly or posteriorly. And the other trick is when you go for ETV, you keep the working channel anteriorly. And when you uh, want to do the biopsy, then you rotate the whole thing, set uh, uh, the working channel should be posteriorly. So you buy about uh, five millimeter and you can move a little bit uh, about five millimeters. So five millimeter of slow movement uh, can be tolerated by uh, Furman Monroe. So there are three options. One can go for singer bar hole when there is a large Furman Monroe, or you can have two separate bar hole for uh, uh, different purpose for biopsy and ETV or you can do a single bar hole and use flexible scope because flexible scope tip can, can, can be moved and uh, with uh, flexible scope, you can do both ETV and biopsy. But the vision usually is not so good, but now uh, with chip on tip and with um, high definition camera, uh, things have changed. You can also do uh, ETV in slit ventricle syndrome and how to do that, that I'll also I'll discuss in my subsequent slide. So multiloculated hydrocephalus after infection or uh, hemorrhage, IVH, intraventricular hemorrhage is a difficult entity, but um, the endoscopy plays an important role. You can break the septas and uh, make these multi-septate hydrocephalus into unilocular cavity, and then you can put in a shunt. So uh, with the help of endoscopy, the chances of revision rate of uh, VP shunt reduces from 2.9, that is 3%, 3 per year, to um, 0.2 per, per, per year. So significant reduction of revision rate of VP shunt can be done. And if you are expert enough, uh, then uh, very rarely in about 10 to 20% of cases, um, you can do also ETV after breaking the septa, but it is technically very demanding. Uh, in slit ventricle syndrome, there can be three things which you can do because the ventricles are small, so it's very difficult to hit the ventricle. So one option is that um, the small flexible scope can be passed along the sun tube, and then you can do ETV, or you can hit the ventricle using stereotactic guidance or USG guidance uh, and use small scope and do the ETV. The other option is that you can, um, uh, you, you can, the distal uh, end of the VP shunt can be exteriorized and you can block it and then you allow the ventricle to dilate and then do the ETV. Uh, there are situations uh, we have come across, uh, the, uh, we have extruderized the distal land, and then there were situations in which there was no ventriculomegaly and patient did not complain of uh, raise ICP or headache. So in such situation, you can just observe. There is no need to do ETV. But if you extruderize uh, and after that, if you 
find that there is a ventricular dilatation or patient has symptoms of raised ICP or headache, in such situation, you have to do uh, ETV. Uh, when you have an uh, intraventricular hemorrhage with hydrocephalus, again, there are three treatment options. You can go for uh, external ventricular drainage and uh, remove the hematoma, but uh, most of the time, the cat catheter blocks, or you can go for a thrombolysis. Again, the chances of infection in both these situations are high, and there is a catheter blockage. Um, uh, the other option is endoscopic removal of uh, hematoma with or without ETV. The, it has a significant role in IVH with, um, with, with hydrocephalus. In NPH, the role of uh, ETV is there, but only in selected cases. When there is a uh, uh, floor of third ventricle is bulging down and the anterior wall of third ventricle is bulging anteriorly. So that means there is some component of obstruction. And in this subgroup, ETV is quite helpful. Uh, if you don't come across these situations, then you can go for the other two options, either a lumbar peritoneal shunt or a VP shunt. Uh, you should be aware that uh, in ETV, there are difficult situations. I told you that ETV can be done when there's a posterior um, fossa tumor, whether it is CP angle tumor or uh, the midline posterior fossa tumor. So obviously the ETV can be done, but it is not uh, for, for the beginner. Uh, you can realize that when there's a tumor in the posterior fossa, it pushes the brain stem anteriorly. So there is hardly any space between the 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 uh, uh, the uh, clivus and the brain stem so to do etv uh, is technically very difficult and at times uh, the brain stem uh, bulges uh, superiorly in the third ventricle so uh, there is a high sloping uh, floor of third ventricle which makes etv difficult for the beginner so uh, in such situation, it is better to do uh, third ventriculostomy on the clivus or on the dorsum celli. Uh, and if you have a CP angle tumor, in such cases, apart from uh, pushing of the brainstem anteriorly, you also have displacement of the midline structures. So the ETV has to be done a little away uh, from the the actual midline in such patient and you should uh, make sure that you don't injure the third cranial now or the posterior communicating artery so be careful and only when you you visualize the structures you should do these um, etv and in cases where there is infection there's a lot of exudate in the acute phase of uh, meningitis then also you should try and avoid um, the ETV, uh, the usual ETV site that is the floor of third ventricle. So in such case, you can go for ETV either uh, anteriorly in the third ventricle, that is lamina terminalis, or posteriorly in the quadriseminal cistern. So if at all you have to do ETV, then you have to choose the alternate site. Now, uh, it is very important to know which cases are suitable for ETV, at least for the beginner. So in pre-operative workup, you should know we, which are the cases which, uh, which are the good candidate. So um, there should be sufficiently large uh, lateral ventricle. The foramen Monroe also should be large so as to, uh, so that it can accommodate the endoscopic set and the third ventricle also should, uh, width should be enough so that your endoscope uh, can be accommodated there. Um, if you have a large intrathalmic adhesions which can occur in spinal dysrephism cases, um, then it may be technically difficult. So you should make sure that there is no large intrathalmic adhesions when you do 
uh, ETV at least in the beginning of your uh, learning curve. And the third ventricle floor should be thin. If it is a thick third ventricle floor, then, then uh, it is difficult to visualize the structures in the floor, especially the vessel, basal artery, and there are high chances of complications. So avoid uh, thick uh, third ventricle floor in the beginning. The, there should be good, good prepontine space. There should be sufficient space between the basal artery and the dorsum celli. Uh, and uh, you should not have a very high riding basal artery. If you have a high riding basal artery, it pushes the floor of third ventricle up uh, and uh, the floor of the third ventricle is sloping. So if you try to perforate um, the floor anterior to the basal artery, your catheter slips. So you have to use uh, other things like um, bipolar forceps or the blunt instrument or perforate on the dorsum celli. Uh, there should be absence of basal exudate. Uh, I have said that if the exudates are there, even if you make the opening in the floor, it doesn't work. Uh, so failure rate is high when you have basal exudate there should not be any abnormal vessel below the third ventricle floor. If it is there, then you should know beforehand, uh, before surgery, and you should avoid uh, injury to that vessel and prevent bleeding. Uh, there is sufficient distance between the midline and uh, the posterior communicating artery. I told you that in CPNL tumor, there is distortion of midline and in such case, uh, because the midline is di distorted, um, you tend to make the ETV little laterally. So there are chances of injuring that artery, uh, which you should always be watching when you do ETV. Uh, knowledge of anatomy, whether there is any additional membrane below the floor of third ventricle or any other membrane also um, should be known uh, when you do ETV. The other factors which you preoperatively you should investigate is that the distal CSF pathway beyond the basal cistern. So not only that the basal cistern should be patent, but uh, the distal pathway also should be patent and there should be good CSF absorption, which is, a which is uh, sometimes quite difficult to know. But if you go for early stroke volume in cinephase contrast MR, if you have a good stroke volume, that shows that the basal cisterns are patent and there's a good CSF absorption. In such case, you can do ETV very well and the success rate is, right, is likely to be high. And uh, in, uh, in some suspicious cases, you can also find out uh, the lumbar outflow resistance and the ventricle outflow resistance. If there is a low uh, ventricle outflow resistance or low lumbar outflow resistance, that means the, the, uh, the subarachnoid space and the cisterns are patent and the absorption also um, at the arachnoid villi level is also patent. Then only you will have this. But on the other hand, if you have a high outflow resistance, that does not mean that ETV is not going to help. Um, it may be because of the CSF um, obstruction because of the ventricular dilatation. Ventricular dilatation may obstruct the subarachnoid space and therefore there may be high outflow resistance. So if there's a low outflow resistance, it is a favorable but high outflow resistance does not rule out that ETV uh, will not be functioning. In the surgical technique, uh, the supine position is used. Some author use semi-sitting position um, and the head should be a little flexed so that the bar hole is at the highest point. Otherwise, um, uh, there may be entry of air especially when there is a high ventriculomegaly. The bar hole uh, side depends on the individual anatomy 
and not that uh, you should make a hole one centimeter anterior to the coronal suture or two centimeter or one and a half centimeter or something like that. So these are individualized and the, this is the most important factor for successful ETV and that you should determine by the individual anatomy or by navigation. So what I do is that you can mark uh, Furman Monroe uh, using a CT or MRI if you don't have navigation. If you have navigation, it is fine. So you mark the midline uh, and uh, you mark uh, the coronal suture and you, you should go towards the external auditory matters. Uh, about six centimeter at depth is the Furman Monroe. But it, depending upon the ventricular dilatation, whether it is less or more, this site may change. So you should exactly land on the Furman Monroe. So it is better that you know it either by navigation or by using CT or MRI and use marker um, uh, on MRI or CT to delineate where the Furman Monroe is there and which is most important point in your surgery. The penetration, um, when you make bar hole about two to three centimeter away from midline, it should be medially and it should be directing towards the external auditory matters when, when the navigation facility is not available. Uh, uh, you can use different kind of sets uh, where there is uh, endoscope in the seat inbuilt and there are irrigation channel and outflow channel, the endoscope and the working channel. So various sets can be used. Um, regarding the trocar, it is better to have trocar with hole. So if you have a trocar with hole, it allows you to know that you have hit the ventricle. If it is not there, then uh, I mean you might uh, face some difficulties. I have already said that it is important to know the proper site of the bar hole. So exact site of the bar hole in coronal plane and in sagittal plane is essential. So how to decide uh, the exact site of the bar hole? And I told you that it should be individualized. You cannot say that it is one centimeter anterior or two centimeter or 1.5 centimeter. So you have a MRI, uh, then you should uh, identify the prepontine cistern uh, and the line should extend from prepontine cistern to the Furman Monroe onto the skull. So this line, um, if you, so the site of bar hole should be here. The line connecting the prepontine cistern to the Furman Monroe to uh, the skull. And then you can uh, measure the distance from the bulb. Uh, uh, likewise, in the coronal uh, plane also, you should start uh, the, uh, I mean, the line joining the midline of the third ventricle uh, floor to the Furman Monroe onto the skull. So the distance from midline to uh, the, the skull site should be the site of the bar hole, but usually even if you remain as medial as possible, that is two to three centimeter away from the midline is all right. But for sagittal plane, it is important to draw that line or to have navigation and you should land directly on Furman Monroe and you should land directly on um, the translucent place in the floor of third ventricle, which is anterior to the mammillary bodies and in between these mammillary bodies and infundibular races, which I'll discuss. So if there is a wrong site of bar hole or trajectory, then you predispose, um, I mean, there will be fornix injury and uh, there may be bleeding also. 
So that should be avoided. So you should have a correct site of the burr hole and you should also have a correct trajectory. So you can have correct burr hole. See in this diagram, please pay attention that the burr hole site is all right. You can make a burr hole at this place and you land at the Furman Monroe and then you make the opening in the floor of third ventricle. So the green line is a correct a bar hole site and the trajectory. The other red and blue line, the bar hole is site is correct, but the trajectory is wrong. So if I make trajectory more posteriorly, then I'll not be landing on to the Furman Monroe and I'll be much more posteriorly in the lateral ventricle. And in trying to uh, reach the Furman Monroe because uh, I have to go through the Foreman Monroe into the third ventricle. Then I'll be moving my endoscope anteriorly. And in the process, I'll be tearing the, the appendinal lining and the cortex. And same is true when you are too much anteriorly there. So there should be a correct bar hole site and there should be correct trajectory in the coronal and, and sagittal plane. The other thing which I want to stress is that um, in coronal plane also, if you have a correct bar hole site and then you go through the Furman Monroe and go in the third ventricle, this is the, uh, the green line is a correct site. But if you are too much uh, medially placed and you go, there are situations where the septum pellucidum is absent in a long standing hydrocephalus. So if you enter wrongly in the opposite side of the uh, lateral ventricle and through the opposite um, Furman Monroe, you go in the lateral uh, third ventricle and then you try to bring your scope in the midline. In the process, you will injure the opposite side fornix and also the ipsilateral fornix. So this, this should never ever be done. Uh, so it is important to have correct site of the bar hole and the correct trajectory in both uh, coronal and sagittal plane. Uh, so how to make the proper bar hole? I said that uh, if you have facility of navigation, it is better. But even if you don't have, then you can mark the Furman Monroe using CT scan, a marker CT or marker MRI, uh, and then you can place um, some marker like even a capsule or something um, on the on the skin and make out that this is Furman Monroe. Although uh, by anatomical landmark also um, uh, you 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 can uh, go there only. So it, the direction of the uh, trajectory should be towards the external auditory matters um, in sagittal plane and it should be slightly medial in the coronal plane. In that case, you will reach at the Furman Monroe. But if you are away from the Furman Monroe, it is better to abandon the trajectory and take uh, another trajectory. So Barhol should be at the highest point. Uh, usually it is on the right side. Am I audible? Uh, it is coming as internet connection is unstable or something like that. Oh, yes, you are audible. yes, sir. Audible, sir. You are okay. audible, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, it is usually on the right side, but there are situations in which you can go from the uh, other side, that is left side, when there is asymmetrical hydrocephalus. So in that case, the one ventricle, lateral ventricle is large, the other is small. So if you have asymmetrical, then you should go uh, from the less dilated uh, ventricle side um, rather than more dilated because more dilated ventricle is likely to have uh, obstruction at the Furman Monroe. And uh, perforation of the septum pellucidum from more dilated side will be difficult. So you can go from the less dilated side you can perforate the septum pellucidum and you can do ETV because that Furman Monroe is likely to be patent on that side. 
um, the blind insertion should not be beyond five to six centimeter um, from the bar hole side. Avoid over drainage of the CSF. Prevent entry of the air in the lat lateral ventricle uh, or in the subdural space. Um, that will uh, will not allow good visualization and uh, uh, do not allow uh, loss of uh, CSF. Otherwise, there may be subdural hematoma. Um, use brain cannula. I have seen people directly uh, entering the ventricle by the 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 seat, whether it is gap seat or uh, the lotus seat or any other seat. So it is better to use ventricular cannula, hit the ventricle, and then use either peel away seat or use the the endoscopic seat. Uh, uh, this using seat is important because. Um, otherwise, uh, you might need uh, repeated introduction of your scope, and that seat should be slightly larger than the endoscope so that uh, the fluid can freely uh, come out uh, when you go for irrigation. So use uh, you can use freehand technique. That means you don't use any endoscopic holder, or you can use holder. I use holder. But I don't uh, uh, lock it, so I keep uh, this unlocked so that I can move my um, endoscope freely. Uh, so I hold the um, the left hand is used for holding the scope. The right hand is uh, used uh, for introduction of the instrument. Telescope holder is used with the loose knob. So the and but it is attached to the endoscopic arm, and uh, the assistant is holding the arm. If they don't hold the arm and it is loose, then it tends to fall, and you have more strain on your left hand by which you are uh, holding the scope. So ask your assistant to support the uh, the arm of the endoscope. Uh, so there is no time wastage in locking and unlocking and you can make a little bit of movement. So the question is why holder at all? Uh, because the procedure is very short, so you can do it freehand, but there are situations in which there may be bleeding during uh, ETV. So in such case, um, if you don't use holder and you have to hold it for a quite long time, there may be fatigue. So uh, in such case, you can use holder and you, you can uh, station your endoscope in the lateral ventricle and hold and hold on for some time till the bleeding stops. So I use holder, but uh, I keep it loose um, and I uh, support my hand through the right hand. I introduce my uh, instrument forcep or anything, ventriculostomy forcep or bipolar forcep, but I support my hand on the seat of the endoscope so that there is no additional tremor or uh, any un unwanted uh, movement. Uh, there is a good precision movement there. Regarding the use of fluid, I use lactated solution as compared to normal saline because the pH and the osmolarity of um, Ringer lactate solution is near the um, uh, CSF uh, and therefore that should be used. Um, a word about dark ventricle syndrome, there are situations when there is a huge ventriculomegaly, large ventricle in an infant so you go in the lateral ventricle and nothing is visualized, everything is dark. So uh, this is because the ventricles are large and the focal length of the endoscope is small. So the structures in the floor of the lateral ventricles are not visualized. So gradually move your endoscope uh, deeper in the ventricles and when the structures in the floor of third ventricle um, uh, will come in the focal length of the endoscope, then it will start visualizing. 
so don't worry if you don't see anything then gradually go inside the, be, because the ventricle is large and this is beyond the focal length of your endoscope therefore you are not able to see anything if you don't see uh, anything the other uh, if it is just a white thing then it may be because of the infection also so in that case irrigate irrigate and uh, gradually the things will clear um, if you are there uh, at a wrong place in the lateral ventricle so these are the two example this is a proper uh, bar hole and the trajectory you should land on the foramen of monroe in the lateral ventricle so that is correct uh, trajectory but if you go more posteriorly or more anteriorly by making a wrong side bar hole or wrong trajectory then it is better to abandon that trajectory rather than moving your endoscope posteriorly or anteriorly and tearing the ependymal margins and the brain uh, so avoid that abandon that trajectory and go at a correct site and same way if you go uh, more posteriorly in the third ventricle or more anteriorly in the third ventricle um, you should land at a translucent place in the third ventricle in between the mammillary bodies and infundibular recess in the midline in the translucent place when you use rigid scope uh, uh, but if you are away from there then don't move your endoscope too much if you move your endoscope anteriorly or posteriorly and if the foramen monroe is small then you will injure the fornix so uh, if there is a wrong bar hole site or a trajectory in that case abandon that trajectory and uh, come again uh, choosing a right trajectory and i have already discussed that if your bar hole site is too much away from the midline and then you try to enter into the uh, through the foramen monroe into the lateral ventricle and then you come in the midline if you are too much lateral going through the foramen monroe then you will be landing on the opposite side of the third ventricle not exactly in the midline and if you move your uh, scope to reach at the midline then you will injure the ipsilateral fornix but if you make too much of mistake you go on to the opposite side fornix using a rigid endoscope and then uh, uh, going uh, very much laterally in the third ventricle and then trying to come at the midline in the process you will injure both the fornix so that should never ever be done uh, if you come across a situation in which uh, you have to do septum pellucidum perforation and etv uh, in such cases the the trajectory for uh, etv will be different and the trajectory for septum pellucidum is different but using a same uh, bar hole or trajectory uh, you can do both etv and septum pellucidum perforation for that you should have you should have um, the uh, uh, single opening uh, forcep um, as shown here sorry somebody is knocking mat aao bhai are chhod yaar so uh, the the forcep which is uh, opening on one side uh, should be uh, i mean use the forcep which opens on one side rather than a forcep uh, in which both the both the limbs are opening so this will make uh, the the septum pellucidum perforation difficult whereas if one limb is opening uh, you keep that limb on uh, towards the septum pellucidum and perforate uh, uh, the septum pellucidum so both etv and septum pellucidum perforation can be done uh, regarding the fenestration in the third ventricle floor foramen monroe uh, can be identified by the confluence of thalmostat vein 
the septal vein and the choroid plexus. So this is the choroid plexus, this is the septal vein, and uh, usually there is a thalamostatic vein going like this. But in this case, it is not visible. Um, the fenestration in the third ventricle floor should be in between the mammillary bodies and the infundibular recess at the most transparent site in the midline. And it should always, always be anterior to the basilar artery. Uh, even if uh, there is a translucent space posterior to the basilar artery, you should never ever do a perforation posterior to this because there are perforators going from basilar artery to the brain stem. And if you make fenestration there, you are likely to injure those brain stem perforators. So never posterior to the artery. The location of the basilar artery should be identified. Um, uh, if it is a translucent uh, third ventricle floor, then you can visualize during endoscopy. But if it is thick, then you should identify with the um, vascular Doppler or navigation uh, or make the third ventriculostomy on the dorsum celli. So do not uh, perforate posterior to the dorsum celli because you don't know where the artery is lying. So make the perforation on the dorsum celli if it is thick wall. And the other, other things I'll discuss so perforate on the dorsum celli if uh, there is a less space between the basilar artery and the dorsum celli. There may be situations when there are posterior fossa tumor, uh, when brain stem has been pushed anteriorly, so basilar artery also has been pushed anteriorly. So in that case, if you make perforation posterior to the dorsum celli, you may injure the basilar artery. So if such situations are there, you should anticipate that and you make perforation on the dorsum celli. Just use the forcep and catch the, uh, the, the membrane there and, and just rotate it and tear it. So tear the, uh, the, the floor and then the CSF will percolate from the third ventricle into the prepontine cistern and you will find some space between the dorsum celli and the artery. So perforate on the dorsum celli if it is the, the basilar artery is pushed anteriorly or when you have a thick floor. Why in the thick floor? When there is a thick floor and if you try to perforate posterior to the dorsum celli, you push the floor of third ventricle too much because it is thick so there is a tendency to displace the floor of third ventricle. So there is a possibility of bleeding from other side because of too much of displacement of the floor of third ventricle. And uh, at times uh, the, the third um, cranial now is attached to the uh, lilicist membrane or the other membrane in the floor. So that also gets stretched and you can produce third cranial now palsy. So do not perforate posterior to uh, the, the dorsum celli when the basilar artery is pushed anterior or when there is a thick floor uh, and there is a displacement when you use blunt perforation. And when you have thick and inflamed floor of third ventricle, you can use water jet dissection, which I described in one of my article, especially in TBM. You can start the dissection with the blunt forceps, but uh, with using the indigenous water jet dissection using uh, the infant feeding tube or any other tube uh, just near the opening at the floor. And then you inject about 10 ml of uh, fluid uh, in about three to five second time uh, using a syringe of 10 ml. Um, uh, that prevents bleeding and it allows opening um, of the third ventricle floor. If you don't see, there are uh, technical nuances. When you do third ventriculostomy and the jaw of the ventriculostomy forcep is not visualized, then these are the three causes. Either there is too much magnification, uh, you have used too much of zoom button, 
So therefore, the jaw of the uh, the ventricular forcep are out of the field uh, of your endoscope, or you have gone too much close to the surgical target area. Uh, in that case, also there is high magnification, and the jaws of the ventricular forcep are out of the endoscopic field. So in that case, uh, dezoom it. Uh, in this case, when there is high or go away from the floor of third ventricle and you will start visualizing um, both the ventriculostomy forcep because you should never ever do anything blindly in ETV. Uh, it should be all under vision. The other possibility is when the endoscope and both jaws of your ventriculostomy forcep are in the straight line. So if this is the endoscope, this is one jaw of the ventriculostomy forcep. This is another jaw of the ventriculostomy forcep. The distal jaw will not be visualized. So uh, move uh, your scope a little bit laterally or rotate your uh, the ventriculostomy forcep a little bit. Both jaws will be visualized and then only you, you open your ventriculostomy forcep. So never ever do anything blindly. Uh, this is my technique of, uh, of making an opening more than 5 mm because third ventricle uh, opening should be 5 mm or more. So uh, at times I make two openings just of the midline. Usually you should make uh, uh, the third ventricle opening in the midline, but I make opening just of the midline, just of the midline, but not as little as uh, to injure the third vent, uh, third, third cranial nerve. So not so much lateral, but just off midline, two to three millimeter off midline. I make these two openings and then I, I join these two opening. Uh, and this is how I make the large opening, which I think, uh, although not proved, but it is helpful in uh, avoiding stoma blockage post-operatively. Uh, a word about uh, the Lilikist membrane. Uh, we all know that there are three divisions, cellar component, diacephalic uh, component, and mesencephalic component. So if you do third ventriculostomy a little more posteriorly, then you might come across two membranes. There will be one membrane that is diacephalic component of the Lilikist membrane and another component that is mesencephalic. So you might have to uh, rupture uh, two membrane, uh, but if you are little more anteriorly, then there will be only one membrane. So all the membrane, uh, whatever you come across in the floor of third ventricle should be, should be fenestrated and you should be able to see the <coughs> naked basilar artery. Uh, the third uh, cranial nerve injury can also happen when there's a thick floor of third ventricle and when the lilicus membrane is attached to the third, vent, uh, th third cranial nerve. So if there is a thick, uh, I mean, lilicus membrane which is attached to the third cranial nerve laterally and if there is a thick floor and you just push it by the blunt uh, forcep, and it displaces the floor along with the uh, third cranial nerve. So already stressed cra uh, third cranial nerve uh, may get further damage and you can produce third cranial nerve palsy. So never ever try to, uh, I mean, forcefully uh, uh, make an opening in the thick third ventricle floor with the blunt instrument. In that case, you can use low current bipolar uh, current at a low setting and then try to make opening and do not uh, displace it too much uh, down. Uh, this may cause uh, uh, third cranial nerve palsy. So if there is a thin floor of third ventricle, then you use blunt perforation. This is the best thing. But if it is thick floor, then initially I use short uh, low bipolar color current so that I can start uh, blunt perforation in the floor to avoid displaced, displacement of the third ventricle floor. 
uh, usually we avoid energy uh, that is any bipolar or monopolar current in the um, in the uh, floor but people have used uh, laser assisted third ventriculostomy which they found to be safe and effective uh, can be used in um, thick floor a dilatation of the stoma should be minimum 5 mm or more and you can use either a Fogarty catheter for dilatation or you can use ventriculostomy forceps for dilatation. Uh, if uh, you want to do ETV and biopsy, I have already discussed that either you can use two bar hole, one uh, for ETV and one for biopsy. If the Foreman Monroe is small, uh, or one bar hole when the Foreman Monroe is large, somewhere in between. So ETV bar hole and a biopsy bar hole, you can make bar hole somewhere in between. Uh, when the Foreman Monroe is small and you can rotate your working channel um, from anteriorly for ETV to posteriorly for biopsy. And uh, or else you use flexible scope Avoid linear movement. If at all you have to use some movement, then you should not exceed a slow movement of 5 millimeter. Um, this has been seen by Ju at all that uh, slow movement of 5 millimeter can be tolerated by the fornix without any injury. But if you have to make some movement, then you can rotate your uh, scope. And by rotating the scope, the, if the working channel is entirely placed, if you rotate it to the 180 degree, then uh, your uh, working channel will come posteriorly. And you can buy about five millimeter minimum, five to six millimeter by just rotation, not by linear movement. So you can rotate the endoscope. The third option is that you keep your endoscope uh, in the lateral ventricle near the Furman Monroe, and then you pass the thin instrument through the uh, Foreman Monroe under vision. So you, you know that the forceps is going through the Foreman Monroe and how much is it, it is causing the distortion of the Foreman Monroe, the, the, then this is not a blind procedure. So this is the third option which can be utilized. Uh, inflate uh, Fogarty or ventriculostomy forceps at the stoma. Do not inflate it below the stoma and then pull it back. If you do it, then you can catch any, any of the perforator and ca can cause injury. So uh, inflate the ventriculostomy forceps or Fogarty at the stoma and not below the stoma because there you can have vessels. If there is any doubt about the ETV functioning, I told you that when you do ETV, uh, and if you find that the floor of the third ventricle is pulsating well, that is a sign of good ETV functioning. And all membranes have, have, been, uh, have been opened. But if there is any doubt about the third ventriculostomy functioning, in that case, you can put in dye. The ioxol can be used uh, 6 cc in adult and 3 cc in, in children and you uh, put the dye in the third ventricle. If the dye washes out in less than one minute, uh, it is a good wash out. That means your ETV will function very well. Uh, the basal cisterns are okay. But if the dye stays in between one to three minutes, then it is a fair, uh, I mean, basal cistern. And then these patients uh, may have problem postoperatively. So it is better to put in either Omaya reservoir there. Um, and if the dye stays uh, more prolonged, more than three minutes, then this ETV is not likely to function. Uh, you should take perioperative decision to do uh, shunt in these cases. Uh, so there can be two situations during th surgery, three situations. Um, there may be favorable anatomy, good pulsations of the stoma, and there's a good cistern, and the flow of the dye is also good. Uh, it washes away within 
less than a minute and you come across a folding sign that means the posterior wall of third ventricle shows some folding uh, that shows that uh, there has been a good outflow. Uh, so such cases are likely to do well. Uh, but if there is a doubtful cases, stoma pulsations are not good. The dye holds on for one to three minutes. The cisterns are scarred. In such case, you use Omaha reservoir. I have seen people who recommend put in reservoir always. So uh, it should not never be always a reservoir or no reservoir. There are definite indications. The paraoperatively, you can make decision that this patient is likely to do well. These patients are likely, these are doubtful cases. You can put in OMIR reservoir and tap the CSF postoperatively for 10 to 15 minute, uh, days. And then you may find that gradually the subarachnoid space may open up. There may be poor risk cases of ETV where uh, intraoperatively, the, either it is technically difficult, the floor of third ventricle is not visible, it is all red. So in that case, it is better to abandon the uh, ETV and go for a shunt. Or there is a bad cistern, or there is a poor flow, the dye stays for more than three minutes. In that case, you go for paraoperative decision that this, is, this ETV is not likely to function and do, uh, uh, I mean, go for a shunt uh, paraoperative. This is what uh, folding sign has been described. Um, uh, after doing a ETV, if all membranes are open, then you might find some, um, uh, some folding in the posterior wall of third ventricle. And this denotes that all the membranes have been opened up. And if you find this folding sign, Although it is not always seen, but if it is there, then it is a good sign of ETV functioning. So indication of OMI reservoir or EVD, I have already discussed the in cisternal scarring. If there is a poor stoma pulsation, if there is a fair flow, that means the dye holds for some time in subacute phase in the infective or post hemorrhagic cases or there are multiple shunt failure. In such cases, usually the subarachnoid spaces are uh, collapsed and it takes some time to open up the subarachnoid space. So if you keep the OMI reservoir for some time and, uh, and, and, and uh, draw fluid postoperatively, then uh, it allows time for the subarachnoid space to open up and the your ETV will, will start functioning. So this OMI reservoir can can uh, elevate. I mean, uh, can decrease the raise ICP if it occurs postoperatively after ETV, and it allows quick access to the ventricle. And you can put in dye or uh, see whether the, your ventriculostomy is functioning or not. Post-operative care is also very important. Um, uh, if uh, the patient after ETV does not improve, then there can be problems. There can be blocked stoma. There can be complex hydrocephalus. There can be cerebral ischemia, especially in TBM. There may be associated ischemia. And if there is a ischemia associated with hydrocephalus, these patients do not improve so well after surgery. So you are in doubt whether your ETV is functioning or not. So these are the various cause or pre-operative neurological status. The patient is already in bad GCS. So in such case, you should find out whether there's a raised ICP or not. Uh, if it is raised ICP, then usually it is either because of block stoma. Uh, in such case, repeat ETV should be done or there may be Plus, that means there is absorption. Uh, so if it is a temporary defect in the absorption of the CSF because of the uh, because of the uh, collapse subarachnoid space after the shunt, 
in that case you go for repeated uh, lps for 10 to 15 days uh, in uh, every 3 to 4 days time allow the subarachnoid space to open up and these patients do well some of them but if they continue to have raise icp uh, that means there is a permanent defect in the CSF dynamics. And in such case, you have to use either a VP shunt or a LP shunt. But if there is a no raise ICP after ETV and patient does not improve, that means the cause of uh, failure to improve after ETV is either because of ischemia or poor neurological status before surgery. Uh, so what does the repeated LP does? It increases compliance and other things. Uh, so one should go for uh, one to three lumbar puncture at the interval of three to four days before you call that ETV is, is a failure. Uh, the failure of ETV usually occurs within three months. So you require a good uh, clinical and radiological uh, assessment uh, but it has been seen that uh, the radiological assessment is not as important as uh, clinical. If you go for radiological assessment, then you may overdo uh, either a ETV, repeat ETV or shunt. So if, uh, I mean, both, if there is a failure to improve along with some radiological assessment showing that the third ventricle uh, uh, dimensions have not decreased. In that case, you can consider that it may be a failed uh, ETV. I think uh, one can use conventional MRI, uh, but it is an indirect sign. Uh, resolution of periventricular edema, widening of the subarachnoid space, these are indirect signs. A diminution of the third ventricle size, uh, if it occurs, that shows that uh, your ETV is functioning. The third ventricle dimensions are more important than the lateral ventricle. So if the height of the third ventricle decreases or the infundibulo chiasmatic angle also is reduced after ETV, that means ETV is functioning well. Uh, the flow wide sign is not that sensitive. There are limitations, but seen a phase contrast, MRI is more sensitive than this, um, which I can skip. But if there is a high suspicion or you don't have a good cine phase contrast MRI at your center, uh, then you can use CT or MR ventriculography. You can put in dye in the ventricle. And if the dye is not coming in the subarachnoid space, that means it, uh, the, the stoma is blocked. Uh, but if the dye is coming in the basal cistern, but your patient is not improving, that means it is a complex hydrocephalus. There's a defect in the absorption and such patient, if there's a permanent defect in the absorption, then you go for L patient or V patient. Uh, the ETV and uh, telemetric ICP monitoring can be done because we know in certain percentage of patient, uh, there is a persistent raise ICP after ETV. In TBM hydrocephalus, uh, uh, there can be three situations. There may be communicating hydrocephalus in which I do LP shunt, lumbar peritoneal shunt. If there is a obstructive hydrocephalus, in chronic phase, chronic phase, after three weeks of diagnosis of TBM and you have given ATT, in that case, if you do ETV, it is likely to work. But if it is acute phase of infective hydrocephalus, then ETV usually doesn't work. So I prefer VP shunt in such cases. Uh, complications can be uh, temporary or permanent fever, bleeding, hemiparesis, gaze palsy, persistent subdural collection, and the memory disorder, altered sensorium, diabetes insipidus, or weight gain or precocious puberty. A word about secondary ETV, this could be when the ETV fails. So re-ETV is also known as secondary ETV. 
or if you do ETV after shunt malfunction, that is also done and known as re-ETV. Re so secondary or secondary ETV, sorry. Secondary ETV after post-traumatic or post-meningitis or after the congenital malformation has high success rate than the primary ETV. So uh, uh, because the, the acute phase is over, so the secondary ETV in these situations have a higher success rate than the primary ETV. If there is a previously shunted uh, patient, then it is better to uh, remove the shunt if you can easily remove it. But uh, if it is densely adherent, and uh, then it is better to leave it there, but you can block the shunt. I think I'll not go into the ETV because time is already, uh, we all know how to do this ETV. Um, the type of floor can be transparent, can be opaque and can be very opaque. So uh, this translucent uh, third ventricle is good and these cases are difficult to do ETV. And if it is very opaque and you don't see any structures there, it is better to abandon the ETV. A word about parotid plexus coagulation. Uh, it is useful in infantile hydrocephalus and especially when it is associated with the spinal dysrephis like myelomeningocele and spina bifida. So if you combine ETV and choroid plexus coagulation in infant associated with the congenital spinal dysrephis, the, the success rate has been found to be more. And also in post-infective and post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus and in and in infants where there's a, a very low cortical mental, means there's a huge ventriculomegaly uh, in infants. So in such case, if you do ETV along with the choroid plexus coagulation, um, the results have been shown to be better and in dandivacal malformation. If there's a bleeding, uh, when you do ETV, reinflate um, uh, the balloon or uh, gently uh, put in the ventriculostomy forcep at the place where it is uh, oozing. So for some time, then it uh, stops and you go for copious warm fluid irrigation and usually small bleed stops. You can intermittently close the outflow channel and create the tamponade effect and the bleeding usually stops if, if, if it is oozing. Uh, Tamponade is better uh, than taking out the instrument. If you are using a ventriculostomy forcep or any blunt instrument, don't try to take it out and then try to bring in the bipolar forcep. The, by the time you bring in your uh, bipolar forcep, it will be all red. So it is important to either reinflate the uh, Fogarty or put in the forcep, blunt forcep on the bleeding side and keep it for some time. Uh, usually the small ooze stops. And the other trick is that uh, they say that create a large cavity that is ventricle, large ventricle into the small cavity. So withdraw your telescope away from the seat. So create a small cavity where there is a translucent fluid, irrigating fluid, which allows visualization of the bleeding point, And then you can just uh, put your seat on the bleeding point uh, and you can see the bleeding point and maybe you can use bipolar and, uh, and uh, close it, I mean, uh, uh, coagulate it. Uh, the air media, if nothing works, then you remove the fluid uh, visualizing the uh, bleeding point in the uh, 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 fluid media is very difficult, uh, but under the air media, you can visualize the bleeding point very well. So um, take out the fluid, uh, put in equal amount of the air and replace the fluid with the air and you will visualize the bleeding point, coagulate it 
and um, if nothing works then uh, uh, you can use tubular retractor under endoscope and uh, stop the bleeding the alternate site of etv uh, can be subfrontal approach and you can fenestrate the lamina terminalis especially in tbm where the floor of third ventricle is uh, is uh, very thick and it is not suitable or you can go transventricular and fenestrate the lamina terminalis or you can open the quadriseminal cistern. So these are the alternate uh, site or from the temporal horn, you can open into the supracellar or perimesian cephalic cistern. So these are some of the alternate site uh, if there's a unilateral hydrocephalus or the usual site is not suitable. Uh, regarding uh, the ETV and AS, uh, success of ETV in children was poor compared to adult in some series. Uh, Kulkarni et al. found that there is a relatively high risk of ETV failure in patients less than six months. But later on, the relative risk becomes progressively lower after three months. Uh, we found, and some other people also found that uh, ETV uh, is not dependent on age. So we do it even in the infant. But what is more important is the success is poor when the infant is premature uh, or um, it is associated with post-hemorrhagic um, hydrocephalus. Uh, so here you see that the ETV success score depends on the age. Lesser the age, there are less chances of success, etiology, post-infective, and in congenital defect or post-hemorrhagic, also there are less chances of success. And if there is a previous uh, shunt, then because of the collapse, subarachnoid space, the success may be poor, but we did not come across this particular finding. So uh, Kulkarni et al. has found that if the success if the score is 60 to 70, then the ETV success rate is likely to be good. But, um, but if it is less, then, uh, then it is likely to cause failure. I think uh, I have already over exceeded, so I don't want to summarize the same thing which I have repeated. So I close it here. Thank you very much. So I have not discussed the complications. It is a separate talk, but uh, I think I have already discussed uh, um, uh, how to avoid complication and how to treat these complications. Um, I, I have already discussed it in one of my articles, uh, rather several of my articles in Neurology India and other journals. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Dr. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It was again as extensive as what you usually teach. Every I'm, possible complication, indication. I'm sorry, sorry for uh, such a long talk, but I think all these things were important for the beginner. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think even from beginner, I think this has been like in reading a whole textbook within around one and a half hours. You have discussed extensively, sir, and we are fortunate enough to have senior panelist, Dr. Hemant Bharatiya, who has trained himself in US as well as a Fujita fellow, and Dr. Rishim Kataria, Professor Rishim Kataria, who is in SMS teaching all, SM, all the uh, undergraduate MC residents as well as a very enthusiastic endoscopic surgeon. We have Professor Ramesh Tigala, again, a very well known endoscopic this, um, uh, uh, endoscopist uh, neurosurgery sir uh, any uh, we, we, i don't see any questions in you know being put up in this particular thing so i'll welcome the panelists to take on something and then discuss i'll uh, let me start with uh, of course Dr. professor yadav wonderful presentation you have covered everything so that's great that and that uh, shows the rich experience of a surgeon 
So what the your experience that you have presented, in fact, small small points. What I would like to emphasize is that for the younger uh, neurosurgeons who are starting to start the ventricular ostomy in uh, at least moderately uh, dilated ventricles or large ventricles is number one. And it is difficult for them to rotate the scope, not to try to rotate the scope for the biopsy uh, in the beginning. Once you are experienced, you have the experience of holding the scope and uh, putting in the instruments. When you are confident of doing it, then one can attempt because uh, I am still afraid of rotating the instrument uh, in a 180 degrees to take the biopsy or doing something. And the <clears throat> second point is about... Uh, Sir, can I, I answer be before I forget? I am an old man. So... Uh, you <laughs> so are younger than me. Been, so, <laughs> so uh, I mean, the thing is uh, that you should never ever do it in the uh, third ventricle. If you rotate it, you might injure the phonics. So bring out uh, your endoscope in the lateral ventricle where there is more space and then you rotate and go inside the third ventricle. You are absolutely right, sir. Thank you. Another point was about the slit ventricle where you said that you can use uh, either a flexible scope or you can use uh, navigation or the third point, either you exteriorize and block the shunt and let the ventricle dilate and then you do the ETB. I would like to know your experience with the flexible scope or doing and uh, doing ventriculostomy in slit ventricle with navigation. You have or you are doing only exteriorizing and blocking and then doing a shunt or you are changing the shunt uh, to programmable shunt or changing the valve or the ventricular catheter in slit ventricular syndrome. So what is your experience? So you are absolutely right, sir. Um, I have, uh, although we have the flexible scope, I think we miss Dr. Subodh uh, Raju. He has experience. I have not used it. I said there are three options. Uh, I, when uh, I come across this situation, then I try and exteriorize the, uh, the uh, I mean, distal hand and then uh, uh, try to get the uh, ventricle dilatation. But that must be done very carefully. These patients may deteriorate uh, quite uh, fast. So you should tell your resident that if something happens very suddenly, then you have to block, I mean, uh, open the exteriorized block distal land. So I uh, have done it in one case, uh, exteriorize it and then uh, block the distal land and then allowed the dilatation of the ventricle and did ETV. Before I give it to the other panelists, I would uh, share my experience that in CP angle or in the accosting neuroma, where I used to do ETV, but uh, the success rate was not very encouraging, so I gave up that, and we usually treat them directly by the excision of the tumor, number one. The other point is that in the slit ventricle itself, you said when you are exteriorizing, the second point you made, when the, there is no ventriculomegaly, no raised ICP or no headache, then observation. Then why did you do the imaging or why, what was the need of uh, doing anything? If there were no symptoms, then what was the need? This was the, I don't know. No, Maybe no, sir. When, when patient had slit ventricle syndrome, that means they usually have intermittent symptoms. So if yeah, intermittent headache. Symptoms, yeah. Uh, intermittent, there is a dilatation and this thing. So in such case, the policy is that uh, you, uh, I mean, exteriorize it and then even after exteriorization, if the patient do not have the symptoms of raised ICP or there is no progressive dilatation of the ventricle, you can just hold on and observe this. If they have ventricular dilatation and the patient has symptoms of raised ICP, headache and other symptoms, then you need to treat them. So there is a very small subgroup, uh, about 20 
to uh, 10 to 20 percent or something like that uh, those patients do not have anything so in the just trajectory just in the trajectory point also you said that towards the external auditory uh, meatus or the canal uh, usually i don't know i i am learning this from you that uh, because we have been doing it towards the nasion or the canthus of the eye, the eye scope also goes in that direction. So this is something new which I have learned that going towards the external canal would be going laterally towards from uh, the burrow. Sir, and, and it would... sir this, this is a mistake. I mean, uh, going towards the external canal in the sagittal direction but also going medially you cannot go laterally you will not hit the ventricle so in sagittal plane see in the sagittal plane from if you can see my head i can go more anteriorly i can go towards the external auditory matrix but angled medially you cannot angle it towards the external mm -hmm. audit in the sagittal plane you should go towards the external auditory matrix Thank you. I will let the other panelists uh, also have their views. What torment is the three directional, you know, the three directional line? Yeah, he In showed that. Again, uh, you have corona. to go medially. You have to go medially. Yeah. So before I pass on to the other panelists, the questions have come up. I think we should answer and then go to the panelists because uh, Dr. John has been asking uh, Do you have advices for hemostasis and breathing control with endoscopy technique alone? Do you have the advice for hemostasis and bleeding control just with endoscope? I think you already elaborated on it now exactly what the bleeding occurs. You know, to try and put, uh, you know, increase the irrigation and then mostly it stops in case if it doesn't stop, then <clears throat> uh, see the bleeding point, replace the water media with the air media. Still, if it doesn't, then you <clears throat> use the tubular retractor. You have covered this point. I hope Dr. Yeah. John gets the answer, sir. I so think then... the other thing is that uh, you should uh, <coughs> try and put the, if it is a Fogarty catheter, don't take it out. You just in, reinflate it. So it stops. Uh, if you are using a ventriclostomy forceps, you have dilated and then you close the uh, limb of the ventriclostomy forceps, reinflate it or put in that forcep uh, on the bleeding point and it stops. If it doesn't stop, then you use intermittent blockage of uh, the outflow, use tamponade effect and uh, keep irrigating usually stops and use air media and uh, like that, which I have discussed. So Andia also has second question. What's your policy for closure regarding to avoid the leakage? And the policy for the ETB failure, institutional yeah. policy. Yeah, so uh, I mean, just for the sake of uh, confidence, how much it works, I don't know. Uh, we usually put in uh, the T-shape uh, abgel uh, in the cortical site. So we just plug the cortical opening using a T-shape uh, abgel. Uh, T shape. Why? Because it it should not. There have been uh, some case report showing that uh, the the abgel has uh, floated in the ventricle and caused uh, blockage of the third ventriculostomy. So this is one thing. Uh, and in infant, I I uh, try to close the dura if possible. This is another thing. Third very important thing when there is a thin ventriculomegaly there is very high risk of CSF leak. So don't remove uh, the sutures early. I remove suture very late. Um, so, so applying these technique, um, uh, it works. Uh, if uh, there is a leak, you should always suspect that there may be a block stoma. So always rule out block stoma if there is a, a leak. Um, except in situation where where uh, there is a huge ventriculomegaly in infant, uh, where where CS might leak even if the stoma is not blocked. So the second question of him is, 
uh, the institutional policy if they say etv failure <clears throat> i go for uh, i mean we go for investigation if it is um, a blocked stoma we go for retv rather than putting in shunt uh, so, yeah and uh, and i told you that uh, before you call as a etv failure especially in infant and young children we go for repeated lp shunt for 10 to 15 days Uh, i mean this duration and uh, we do it 3 to 4 times at the interval of 3 to 4 days um we come across usually when you do etv in infant uh, the the after the etv the af uh, goes down after 4 5 days it bulges again you do a lumbar puncture uh, it goes down after some day it again comes back so before you call it as a etv failure you should go for 3 to 4 times lumbar puncture and you buy some time for 10 to 15 days by doing that you increase your etv success by at least 20 to 30% more thank you and sir especially uh, after the uh, uh, i mean shunt in after the shunt also that is secondary etv Uh, there is usually a collapse subarachnoid space and it takes some time so there is a persistent raise icp either the patient will continue to have a headache and you have if you are impatient then you go for uh, uh, shunt surgery and you say that it is a failed uh, etv so uh, before you call it as a failed etv you should give sufficient trial um, but make sure that you, the stoma is functioning before you do uh, repeated this thing or during surgery if you have a suspicion and you have put in a omaya reservoir then you can tap the uh, csf from there so dr jermi has a question sir which is a you do you are told about that folding sign though it's uh, not seen in all the patient wonderful folding sign you showed it showed the picture also he want to ask is it a better sign or is empty basilar sign is a better sign no uh, the best sign is you see i have not observed this but i have taken all the review of literature this has been described by someone which they found it is quite effective in 70% cases uh, this has been reported in the literature but i have not observed you, we usually do not have that angle scope uh, in our institution uh, but this has been described in the literature that if you find this this is a good thing the best sign during surgery is a flopping floor of the third ventricle if you find that the floor of third ventricle is uh, flopping going up and down down uh, it's an excellent sign that you are uh, you have uh, i mean broken the floor and also you have broken the 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 lilicus membrane or any other membrane in the floor so that is the best sign one can have during surgery so uh, we will uh, pass on this question to uh, our two panelists esteemed panelists you know it's very difficult to establish the the etv failure as such because you know patients are worried in the sense they come with large head patients expect dramatic relief so if i ask uh, uh, my panelists expert panelists when should you do the next ct to say that yes it is reducing or should we include just a head circumference or say suppose if we do it in the later stage where there is a large head after 18 months when so what exactly is the thing should we go for mr studies as sir has said you know that uh, uh, to find out the uh, the stoma this thing okay or should you do ventriculography which would be better Doctor Ramesh and Doctor uh, Rasim. I can I can take this question. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, before yes. I go in, uh, I would like to personally congratulate Dr. Priyaba for excellent uh, talk. It's like an encyclopedia of uh, and second scopic third ventricle class literature. Uh, regarding your question, usually it depends on the clinical parameters. Like uh, mostly, it's uh, uh, they have a bulging fontanel uh, when it is before one one and a half year time. the flat fontanel is one sign of uh, working etv secondly their nutrition improves their appetite like usually most of the kids 
because of the gross raised intracranial pressure their feeding is very poor that is a common complaint from the mother side actually that the one sign and uh, patients the baby's uh, activity improves actually their day to day activity improves those are the base clinical signs which suggest that there is a functioning etv or there is no at least drop in the icp initially uh secondly if you have a leak or if you have a tense fontanel then it's definitely requests to investigate at least with a basic ct to see is there any bleed inside the ventricular cavity because of the procedure or there is a persistent uh, pvl is seen then if it, that is observed then we can go for at least uh, uh, mr cst flow studies or some contrast dye studies to demonstrate is there any functional stoma is available or not if that is not seen then as sir said like we can attempt uh, multiple lumbar punctures which nowadays many people are not doing that one because of the non invasive test so if that is necessary then we can do the multiple lumbar puncture uh, techniques for one or two days and see how the baby reacts if they don't respond then uh, based on the mri findings either we can try for a redo etv or a shunt uh, which are is feasible in the given circumstances can be adopted based on the clean core radiological findings that's what we routinely follow i think dr jermy asked the same question which i just raised you know uh, uh, yeah. how long should we expect I, to decrease the head if, circumference if i if i add the excellent answer uh, from dr ramesh Me. thank you um Uh, of the two if you take clinical versus radiological clinical should be given more importance there were studies in which they did regularly ct scan or mri uh, mri studies and they found that they did unnecessary too much of etv or reprocedure shunt so clinical criteria is more important than radiology the diminution in the size of the ventricle takes very long time it may take very long time so the radiological uh, improvement may be delayed the clinical is more important but if you should take both of them if there is a suspicion then uh, rely on both uh, and uh, compared to lateral ventricle size reduction the third ventricle size reduction is more important number 1 and rather than having these ventricle problem i i think more important in my clinical practice is that if you find the opening of the subarachnoid space after etv that shows the, the the csf has come out of the ventricle and go go on there so initially there was collapse subarachnoid space which opens up after some time or if there is a periventricular lucency which has disappeared uh, although the ventricle size may not uh, reduce so some indirect sign also should be taken into consideration thank you sir like uh, swami if you allow me uh, so can i take uh, two three comments on that one uh, yeah, yeah, please in please. session uh, please, please. Uh, regarding what you shown in one of the slides you are given a vertical incision paramedian So, what is your common practice? Either you give a semilunar incision or a vertical incision, which one you prefer? Because commonly we use a semicircular incision so that it will flap will cover the bar holes, right? It will have a better closure than a vertical incision, which has a high rate of C-sec leak. What I personally observed in my practice, and I've seen most of the people uh, think, practicing uh, the same thing. And uh, in addition to this, actually, one of the uh, like. Uh, delegates has asked a question regarding csf leak especially in uh, uh, neonates or infants when you are doing an etv skin and pericranium we can raise it to different plus in two different directions when you close we can reimpose them and take one or two stitches even for the pericranium just like a double flap so that can also prevent uh, uh, regular csf leak especially in the very tender kids when you are doing the etv that's what i personally observe you take the pericranium also as a flap and then when close you can put one or two stitches doesn't need a watertight closer but uh, approximating the, that thin layer over the bar hole site can also give a added advantage of preventing the csf leak uh, you can you can answer for the skin incision sir yes yes so uh, if i can show the slide uh, 
uh, <clears throat> because of the lack of time i did not uh, did not play that uh, video i think can, uh, can, can you see this uh, yes sir oh oh uh, i think what is happening okay and for aqueductus you know says addition he was drowsy the hydrocephalus due to aqueductus uh incision i am sure so fine under so see this incision we also give i mean this was just a diagrammatic representation which i was okay so the incision given is uh, curved this yeah, is the trajectory mm. towards the uh, the in the sagittal plane i would not that it is going towards the ear it is in the sagittal plane you can go deep uh, this side also entirely when the, the patient is draped or you can go posteriorly so in sagittal plane you should be towards the external auditory meatus then you will hit the uh, i mean you will go at the foramen monro uh, but uh, in coronal plane you have to go medially you cannot go laterally it is impossible yeah. hit the ventricle yeah. yeah one more comments are here actually your head kept neutral what is your common practice do you turn the head to the opposite by 15 to 20 degrees that for the angle from fit in the midline to the angle of the lateral ventricle because when you turn that much angle opposite you can perpendicularly enter into the ventricle in the mid pupillary line is the one standard landmark which everyone takes from nasian to enian anywhere you hit the skull perpendicular to the mid pupillary line you tend to enter into the lateral ventricle so that is one another landmark to enter into the lateral ventricle and from there you can have a uh, track of uh, under vision uh, approach towards your foramen of mahonro and then to the third ventricular floor so do okay. you practice any tilt of the uh, head no, or I'll... not or you keep the ventricle you keep the head uh, in neutral position i keep the head in neutral position but i flex the head uh, yeah just to make sure that uh, the bar hole site is at the highest point but for orientation i don't uh, i don't rotate the head i keep it okay. straight in the neutral position yeah, yeah. okay so okay. uh, ramesh uh, yes. answer the question was something like if it's a vertical incision as compared to circumferential incision yeah uh, exactly there are papers on this but then my sincere opinion is if the etv is not working whether it's circumferential or longitudinal it's going to leak yeah and if it's working yeah. So obviously there is no problem but okay, but, uh, if you, uh, but if you raise a flap he is right uh, yeah. I mean, it is better yes better closer will also be little better sir because even better. a micro leaks through the subcutaneous uh, leak also both will be of, a problem both of you are yeah. correct uh, but yeah one uh, one last uh, question from my side sir what about your uh, take on aqueductoplasty because uh, if you see last two decades of practice what i personally seen you are no more see huge neglected hydrocephalus in india first thing and second thing in day to day practice we are encountering more of a neonatal hydrocephalus because of the bleed or infection that's why because uh, with uh, decent uh, fetal medicine work up most of the congenital hydrocephalus have been detected in the first time as itself and most of them like meningomyelocele associated are a congenital hydrocephalus have been detected before second trimester in most of them they go for termination they are not letting the babies to deliver with these kind of uh, morbid conditions so at least for the last 5 to 6 years we are not seeing those uh, congenital standard aqueductal stenosis presenting in a neglected stage where you tend to operate beyond 6 months 1 year 2 years like that so uh, did you observe the same findings or not one and if you are doing a properly uh, nice vent- third ventriculostomy do you still require to do any aqueductoplasty in case of aqueductal stenosis not the complete stenosis even a thin membrane it is there is there any role for that except in parasitic cysts which are blocking the stoma you can clear them and the passage will be cleared so what uses yeah yeah that is a completely valid thing 
I don't do any acuductoplasty because the rate of complications, except in a sub, very small subgroup where there is a thin membrane. Uh, but if there is a I mean, long distance acuductal stenosis and you try to dilate it, you create more uh, brainstem uh, problems uh, rather yeah, than doing it. Plates. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it is better to do ETV. And I don't do any acuductoplasty except <laughs> that thin membrane is there and you just break it uh, with the catheter. It is all right. Um, so this is regarding uh, that question. What was another one? Uh, whether you uh, see, see neglected uh, cases. Hydrocephalus nowadays. Yeah, we see most of them. We see poor patients, you see. Uh, the yeah. things might be different in big cities, but yeah. in um, our setup, uh, the poor patient from tribal area, they come with very large head, neglected. Uh, yeah. One more in, add in uh, to this, sir, uh, especially in neonatal hydrocephalus, because we commonly see them, uh, IVH or infection. Uh, usually, ventricular subgillal shunt is one thing which probably. Uh, it's good to add to the juniors because age, when it comes to a parameter of selecting the ideal case for ETV, uh, invariably younger than three months, it's unlikely that the ETV will work well. So in those cases, probably if the patient comes with these complicated hydrocephalus, oh, ventricular yes. subgillal shunt is one excellent alternative temporary CSF diversion procedure, which most of the juniors can adopt before they plan for a permanent uh, procedure like ETV or a shunt. So probably there's one thing which I think uh, is good to add to your uh, presentation for the junior sec at least. So just yes. one can I add to your this uh, about the equiductoplasty. What uh, Dr. Yadav said that it is a long segment block. Obviously, long segment block is a not very ideal situation for equiductoplasty. But if it is a short uh, block or the membrane, then I, I, am, membrane. I, I am very comfortable doing aqueductoplasty along with ETV because one is that you feel comfortable, you feel safe. Number two, what I feel is that because uh, aqueductoplasty and rupturing membrane is more physiological because that is the normal pathway of CSF. And doing ETV is not the normal pathway of CSF. It is we are creating a bypass. That is the difference. So one should not, in my opinion, hesitate doing aqueductoplasty when it is short segment or a membranous aqueduct. And if you can do it safely, then one uh, should do simple it. Simple physiological understanding is if you have a working aqueduct and the normal passes, the flow across the stoma will be reduced. And once there is no flow, it tends to close. That's about the common physiology. So when you have get a case of aqueduct stenosis, our first attempt is to do the ETV. If you have a successful ETV, you can do the aqueductoplasty or not, it's immaterial. But if your aqueductoplasty is opening, probably your stoma is tend to close soon because the flow can be bypassed through that. So only when you have a flow, CSF flowing, then it will get epithelialized and the stoma will be patented. Once there is no flow, then it tends to close in a natural process. That's what the uh, like uh, general physiological process, what it happens. That's why I asked that question. What is your take on doing a regular aqueductoplasty, even in a thin membrane aqueductal stenosis? So your question is very well taken for answer. So this is what the physiological explanation for that. So I have, I have two questions to ask to Dr. Yadav. So congratulations for a wonderful presentation as always. One is like as the age decreases, the success of the ETV it also like decreases. So do you have any cutoff age for ETV? No, no. I mean, not that. Uh, I mean, you want to say that uh, the extreme age uh, infants and the elderly also the success decreases. Um, we hardly get uh, the proper case uh, in the elderly, except uh, you can say 
that NPH. NPH may be oh, situation. Yeah, I'm asking for infants, like. Infants, you are talking. Yeah. yeah. Like as age, uh, the, age increases. Decreases, like. Right. Yeah, you are right. Uh, I mean, there are reports, but uh, we have not found it uh, significant. We do it at uh, just on day one. Uh, we have not done it uh, antenatal, but uh, if anybody comes with the hydrocephalus, we operate. Uh, we have analyzed our results of uh, ETV in infant and published also, and we found that the patient subgroup in which there is a low birth weight, we found them significant low birth weight, malnourished patient, premature infants. So success rate in premature infants, malnourished uh, infants are poor compared to those who are um, well nourished and full term. So in our study, there was no significant difference between the A's and the ETV. So the second thing is like we do it. mostly, we do mostly, it. We, uh, in mostly we are we are making the hole in the tuber cinerium, the thinnest part in the tuber cinerium is the typical location of the hole to be made. So so do you have any experience of making a hole in the lamina terminalis while doing ETV? I did not um, uh, do it because uh, for that, I think you need a flexible scope. Cool. But to be very, I mean, Frank, I have not used flexible scope. When we had the flexible scope, the quality was poor. And now uh, when, when I found that there is a problem in the floor, then most of the time uh, the ETV usually does not work except in situation in uh, meningitis where uh, the lamina terminalis can be opened up. So I have no experience, but the literature says, and um, I think Dr. Subodh Raju also, or Dr. Uh, yeah, Tengla, I did a couple of cases, have, sir, uh, because we have the flexible scope. We regularly do when we don't get the proper anatomical landmarks in the standard third ventricular floor, we can approach that or go posteriorly and try to communicate into the uh, other systems, if it is possible, because we want to do the uh, endoscopic third ventricular infected case, or where shunt failure rates are very high, then we try to find out a place where you can do the endoscopic third ventricular Most uh, commonest will be the lamina terminalis. I have an experience of a couple of cases. It does work, but uh, usually 99% of the cases, you don't need to go beyond the standard third ventricular That's what is my experience also. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. The last question is there. Which is the best position in case you do two per hole, one for ATV and one for uh, biopsy? Dr. Nish, anybody who can take Dr. Okay. Uh, so I, I think I have addressed that so if what? you have large uh, Furman Monroe, that means a large ventricle, uh, in those cases, even a single bar hole uh, may be in between. So you make a line. Um, uh, for ETV and may make a trajectory for biopsy and exactly in between these two you can make if you have a rigid scope. So large foramen Monroe even bar hole, single bar hole with the rigid scope is all right but if you have uh, facilities of uh, uh, flexible scope uh, which is giving good quality then um, in any case you can have ETV and biopsy uh, with a single bar hole. People have described a sort of an elliptical uh, thing or a single uh, incision and two bar hole, one for ETV and biopsy also. So different combinations are there. If you have a large uh, Furman Monroe, one single bar hole for both can work because you can move your scope a little bit. Uh, if you have flexible scope, obviously, um, with whatever small or large Paraman Monroe, you can do both the things. Okay. Or so you, you can want... do two, two bar holes. Yeah. You want to know in that case, if the two bar holes are made, what is the best position? In the sense, should it be supine or should it be? No, it is always supine. Yes. Supine. supine. Hope Dr. Supine. Jan, you have answered. Can I? So can use I no questions, sir. No, 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 no. Yeah, about sir. One, one thing that 
uh, Dr. Yadav, have you used uh, two scopes? Like if you are using LOTA system scope and, and then and then scope in use LOTA because LOTA has more diameter, and then you use uh, the GAP system so that you can go posteriorly. You can do ETV with one, and then because that uh, is the trajectory will be more dilated. So then if you use the GAP, which is the smaller in diameter than LOTA, then you can go posteriorly. So then the chances of damaging or injury or bleeding would be less. Have you used any time this? No, sir, th not this one, but people have described scope in scope. So that means there is a rigid scope and then through the working channel of uh, rigid scope, you pass the flexible scope. So do one thing, I mean, uh, maybe ETV or biopsy, whatever with that scope and with the flexible scope. In that case, what they do is that they keep rigid scope at the Foreman Monroe so that there is no injury. And then uh, take it in the third ventricle, the flexible scope and move the way you want. So that is known as scope in a scope. And this is more useful when uh, you want to go um, in the uh, uh, the posterior fossa through the aqueduct also. Yes, in, uh, aqueductal procedures. Yeah. Mainly, I think that Suri described it for uh, a neurosis circle, uh, 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 circle removal circle. through the fourth ventricle cell. Yeah. But I think uh, they are not advertising the these people uh, the uh, chip on tip. So uh, once we get this chip on tip uh, easily available, that chip on tip is available. Sir, nowadays gob is not available. So they stop the gob manufacturing. You get only two little lota and standard lota nowadays. So okay. source one actually. So we need to use them only when we had the gob system. It was good to pass on the catheters also because we used to send a lot of fans uh, from the Monroe trans aqueductal stent where there is a fourth ventricular outlet obstruction, a trapped fourth ventricle. That also we used to do. Through the LOTA system, it's very difficult to pass the catheters uh, through the working channel actually. So I don't know, some reasons, uh, stores is not ma uh, marketing the GAP system nowadays. Those older people who kept it, it is available, but uh, new, if you want to purchase, it's either a little lot or a standard lot from the stores at least. Gab basically uh, it tends to break. I have uh, Gab also and Lota both, but mm. the old one maybe they are not marketing now. Yes, yeah, because it's an open channel, uh, working channel, so it's easy to pass the catheters at least to manage those the tap fourth ventricular tap inoculated uh, uh, system when you want to break even them. Even with the, see, even with the LOTA system also, you can, you can, yeah. you can put your working channel posteriorly, number one. Number two, you, you curve the tip of your, uh, the tip of the catheter sometime, which is used in urology and other uh, cardiac people. So we borrow from them. You can bend the tip and manipulate it, I mean, negotiate it through the aqueduct of Silvius, it is possible. Uh, we use it for neurocystic sarcosis. This mm. Dr. Emil Bharti has said that he does uh, aqueduct proplasty repeatedly. Dr. Vijay Seth wants to know, in case if you've done third ventriculostomy as well as aqueduct proplasty in your long-term follow-up, uh, how has the third ventriculostomy stoma closed up because aqueduct is opened up now? See, it is very difficult to find out which is working and which is closed unless you do imaging and the contrast in imaging you do and see how much which is working, which is not working. In our setup and our practice, we usually don't follow up like this. But what uh, Professor Ramesh said that if uh, you have done both, then uh, ETV might close because uh, the CSF might flow from the aqueduct or whatever it is. But what I feel is that there may be some CSF going through the ETV also, at the same time, some CSF going through the aqueduct also. So the only point of doing it was because that is the physiological pathway of CSF flow. 
So that anything which is physiological and anatomically correlating, so that would definitely work better than what uh, ETB would work. Uh, that's what is my feeling. And wherever we, I have done what is Vijay said's question, wherever I have done equitectroplasty along with, I think we have got better results than doing only ETB. Yeah, Thank so you, both, Thank of, you. both of you uh, are correct, uh, both uh, Dr. Amesh Tagla. The literature says that uh, patent aqueduct uh, is a risk, risk factor for closure of ETV. So this is very well documented, but you are also right, sir, that it is more physiological and uh, nobody knows which, which is working, which has failed. Uh, so, but I think uh, now people are not uh, doing uh, more uh, aqueductoplasty I mean, it is rare except for uh, very thin uh, film, see, I mean, very uh, film-like uh, membrane. Uh, yes, your sir. experience obviously is uh, better. I have not done it, sir. The literature says that uh, biggest the limitation for doing it, biggest limitation for doing acutectal blast is you need to have a flexible scope, you have a proper assessment. So regiscope always over stretching and over holding can cause initial injury. So flexible scope is now available with very few centers. So many people, they are happy with doing ETB and just close it in time to stand. Yes, Dr. Oh, Dr. 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 We already pointed out, you know, tectal plate injury as well as, you know, the gray matter surrounding the aqueduct. Long term, you know, they produce spasticity and then, you know, because of injury, all long track signs. Mm -hmm. So we have finished this particular question uh, answer session, sir. Okay, then uh, we must thank uh, all the uh, panelists uh, and uh, uh, John, sir. So over to you, uh, John, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the excellent presentation. And thank you, the panel. Thank you, panelists, for joining us and thank making you, this sir. wonderful session. Thank you very John? much. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. That was a very interactive session once again, contributing to education in neurosurgery. I appreciate uh, that, Dr. Yadev. And next week, endoscopic management of deep-seated infraparenchymal hematoma and tumor. Correct, uh, Dr. Yadav? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, yes, great. Sir. Okay, yes. we'll see you all next week. Okay, thank you. Good night. Good morning. Good morning. Thank, you. thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.